people that are running the place. Hi. Uh, we, yeah, we can't do that, so we have to X that. Because, you know, the sign outside the door? Anyway, I tried, but we sort of got busted, but we're all right. Hey, welcome to class today. Uh, we just have uh, one, two, three, four more presentations on our classes. Getting ready for our last exam, which is a kind of a final exam, but it's not cumulative. It'll just cover the material we've covered since uh, the last exam. And most of us are like, uh, we're in the basement here of the library, and we're wet and cold. A storm just passed through. If you saw all these lovely raggedy bodies out here. Um, uh, but uh, we're, we are... We've been looking at uh, world religions, and last time we looked at the four stages of faith development, and by Westerhoff, if you remember that, and uh, I can't find them to go over them, but I know we have them someplace. Um, I don't really need to go over them because you can just look back in the uh, in the uh, in your notes or something to do that. What I want to do today is introduce a new topic and. Uh, uh, for me, this is kind of part of where the whole course is building toward. And I want to talk about the self as opposed to the ego, which is a second uh, center of, the con of, our war of our humanity, of our experience. There's two centers. One is the ego, which is the center of our conscious world, and then the self. Uh, I was just looking at uh, some notes from a personality theories class. And the stuff I like to present in uh, many of my classes is Jung's theory. Carl Jung's theory, turn the light on over here. And the reason it is, is it kind of, uh, uh, it's a perspective, a valid perspective. It's often not uh, J-U-N-G. Uh, but, but I think it brings an interest and a dimension of depth and breadth of, uh, and Jung's uh, work is called analytical psychology. It's called analytical psychology. P-S-Y-C-H-O-L-O-G-Y. Or it's also called, you'll see it in literature, called depth psychology. Depth psychology. And you'll remember, remember my uh, <laughs> wonderful little iceberg. Can't have a class without me drawing the little iceberg. And what the iceberg, uh, the, the, the uh, symbolism around this is that there's a whole lot more to ourself than uh, we know, that, but, but it's stuff we don't know about ourselves. And the conscious world, remember we're kind of born into consciousness, and we have to establish this thing called an ego, which is the Greek word for I or me. And the ego, is in, we took that last semester, uh, I mean last test, about the center of our conscious world for uh, decision making, willpower functioning you have to have a good ego many of you ha had a good ego today getting over here you figured out how to get through the rain and the stuff and uh, you know up here is sort of the world and then uh, below the below the water level is the unconscious if above the water is the conscious world this is sort of basic psychology but I find this this understanding really to be not only uh, understandable and interesting and applicable but also very uh, mystical and interesting and it it kind of moves us away from treating each other like objects and things and just uh, sort of trees in the forest but honoring that there's much more to every person including ourselves but there's much more to every person and uh, anyway and so down below here it's called the psyche um, and let me just do this. It's interesting. I'm going to talk about today about the self. And the self is both center and circumference of the personality. In other words, our ego is owes its existence to the self. We talked about the creative daimon uh, in the first half of the class, that we come into this world... Uh, as Wordsworth said, on a trailing cloud of glory, there's just something of our essence that is more than just uh, animal or machine. And uh, so the self is both center and, and circumference. If I did a circle, it would be my essence is both at the center of who I am, 
but it's also all around who I am. And I know this seems mystical and weird and stuff, but I think you'll see it as we, as we look on with it. And this was Jung's contribution was that in the unconscious was not just the dumping ground of instincts or things not acceptable, like the Freudian model says, but also in the unconscious was uh, uh, lied your potential. And um, also, we had instincts, and then we had these ideals, the shoulds, oughts, and have tos. They lay deep within us. And Freud's model, remember, was that uh, anything that wasn't acceptable to the world, uh, we had to throw in the unconscious. And dreams were just living out those things we couldn't handle in real life. Well, here's what's fun when we're looking at religion and uh, world religions and understanding different cultures. There's language for this, uh, this inner world. Uh, this is also another way to call this would be psyche is the Greek word for soul. It's also the Greek word for butterfly, which you'll see me draw one, find it. <laughs> what? Yeah, oh, antenna, thank you. Anyway, this butterfly is in big trouble. Uh, but, uh, well, but a butterfly is a great symbol, isn't it, for life that we go through these experience of uh, being put in a dying uh, eggs in a chrysalis uh, cocoon, and then we come out with new wings and new life. And we kind of go through this over and over in life, where it seems we move from one place of being to another place to another place throughout the... Um, now, let me uh, tear this up and show you, use this, because I want to show you that... that uh, the religions of all, all world religions since the beginning of time always talk about this inner world. And uh, I want to just talk about what it is. This, this part here called the psyche. And you'll know when psychology is study of psyche. And psyche would be soul, would be study of the soul. It's interesting, we've made it just the study of mind. And we forget the breadth and depth of our humanness. Uh, psychopathology, psyche is soul, pathos is suffering, ology is study, it'd be, it, psychopathology would be how the soul suffers, the suffering of the soul. So if someone comes into my office in my private practice and they're uh, depressed, really depressed, well obviously there's a, there's a medical uh, uh, origin perhaps, we look at that, we look at a lot of things, but we'd see the, the suffering of the soul in the depression would be it's almost like the self, the psyche, the soul, is expressing itself in this suffering. So it would be psychopathology, anxiety. And rather than write people off as, oh, you're just some sicko, take this pill, do this, you'll feel better, that's not to say people don't need medication. But to see, what is the soul trying to say here? What, why is this person, depression means to hold down. What's being held down? Often it's a grief or a loss that's just overwhelming, a sadness. Uh, anxiety is fear, and, and some, some, the, uh, the ego is often being threatened by something without or something within, and the ego expresses all this anxiety. And so it's like, gee, I wonder what the soul is trying to express through this suffering. What's going on underneath? So let me give you some of the language here um, of what we call this. Uh, in old literature, you'll find this used to be called the imago... Day, which means what in Latin? Anyone? What does that mean? Imago Day. Deo. <laughs> Dio, uh, Dios. Well, it's the image of God. It used to be called that. Uh, uh, Buddhists call this inner world uh, the more. And if you're Buddhist in this class, speak up. It's also called, Buddhists all call, also call it the true self. And those of you out of a Hindu tradition, what do Hindus call the inner person, inner soul of souls? Is there no one out of a Hindu tradition here? What is it called? You don't know what it's called. That's all right. Uh, it's called the Atman. Have you ever heard of that term? Atman. Atman is soul of souls. You know how uh, when Hindus will come together, they'll put their hands together and they'll bow in front of each other? Southern traditions do that. Have you ever seen people do that? They walk up. What they're doing is they're, they're acknowledging the presence of God, the mystery, the Atman, the soul of souls, 
that is in you, the person that just walked up. It's like, wow, you know, God has just come to me in a new manifestation when you walked up. Uh, other language that calls this, the Christian community calls this, uh, uh, the Apostle Paul called it the Christ in you. Um, other traditions call it God within. Um, other people call it the real you. <laughs> you get this? It also can be called the inner world. Yeah, this is all this part of ourselves that's in the unconscious. The essence of who we are, of which our conscious world is just a sliver, and the ego is just a small part of that. This, these are just names for this mystery. Uh, that'd be another word, is your mystery. Uh, another word is, uh, you'll see this in, in uh, New Age stuff, it talks about your potential. See, um, I've also seen it called, this is this inner world, is also called the um, not yet you. It's the part of you that's not yet, that will come forth. That's, that's wait, waiting to come forth. It's also called um, uh, oh, uh, the divine spark. And all of this is other manifestations throughout the religions of this, this God within, this mysteriousness about the human, uh, uh, the, uh, the human being. Um, you know, uh, Muslims, how many, how many names are there for Allah? Uh, 99? There's more than 99. I, I, a student gave me a list of 99 names of, of Allah, of, of God. And uh, when, when you read those and look at those, it's like, wow, th these are so many of the characteristics of the human experience uh, of how you experience God and the mystery all throughout life. Um, are there any other words of any of your traditions that I missed in here? But you'll find that this language, and the, one of the reasons I'm doing this is many of us forget that the religions of the world are really... The psychology is the study of the soul. It's how we re relate and react and encounter and live a meaningful, purposeful life. And I find cultural psychology so fascinating because uh, what happens is all these expressions of our inner world um, we see reflected in, in outside of us. Um, this quote I have here, uh, right here, which I shared earlier, we see our gold in others, meaning we carry within the wonders we seek without. For Africa, this is a metaphor, of course, and all her prodigies lie within the human soul. Um, um, Joseph Campbell writes, uh, and he has a, a book out that, that was written posthumously, a collection, it's Thou Art That. This is a great Buddhist thing. Thou Art That. I am everything I see. I am everything uh, uh, I encounter outwardly and within. Uh, one of the handouts I gave you on uh, by Rumi, who is the Sufi uh, teacher, uh, one of my students in another class gave me this last week. And, and see, see how Rumi uh, is uh, connecting with this, this, this encounter with this other. Oh, that's another word. Let me do this. Hold on. See, another word for this would be called uh, uh, the other. Uh, it's also called the great unknown. And I don't mean this totally like it sounds, but, but we, the problem with most of us now is we're so undereducated. This is the language all through literature, and most of us don't read literature. We don't know the sacred stories. We don't know... Um, much of the whole romantic literature, world literature, but it all talks about this kind of stuff. And um, although I'll share in a minute how it's come, become very contemporary, let me just read this and as Rumi kind of honors that we're having these encounters with this other. He says, the guest house. This being human is a guest house. Every morning a new arrival, a joy, a depression, a meanness, a momentary awareness comes in an unexpected visitor. 
welcome and entertain them all. Even if they're a crowd of sorrows who violently sweep your house, empty of its furniture, still treat each guest honorably. He may be clearing you out for some new delight. The dark thought, the shame, the malice, meet them at the door laughing and invite them in. Be grateful for whoever comes because each has been sent as a guide from beyond. Now see, that's a, a, a Muslim, Sufi, desert dweller, 14th century mystic man. And yet I find his words just radiate with the experiences of my life. See, the experiences that I have with the mystical, the strange things that come in and out of my world. Well, all of that would be an encounter with what we call uh, the self. Um, flip over on the other side of that. And, and I'll read this just because it's... This is from Edward Edinger, a book called Science of the Soul. And for those of you on, uh, watching it on tape, you can get all this on their internet, uh, on the website. And he says, the self, there it is, the self, as opposed to the ego. He says, the self is, the very, is a very big subject indeed. It is what you come to if you penetrate all the way to the core of the collective unconscious. You know, kind of the waves and the ocean, if you go deep down the ocean. One uh, of its features of the experiences of the self is that it opens up one to the awareness that there are two centers of the psyche. That's the momentous discovery of the 20th century made by Carl Jung. That there are two centers of the individual psyche, not one. The ego is one and the self is the other. And when the experience of self erupts in the individual, suddenly one is aware, I'm not alone in my own house. Somebody else has been living here all the time and I've never known it. This is, he says, that is a momentous experience. The prototype of this, of course, is the experience of the external other. We have... We all have the experience very early in life and learn to adjust to it. The very young child realizes that this is, that it is not the center of the universe, that there are other centers that claim equal consideration. That that then leads the whole phenomena of socialization of the ego, the realization of the outer other. The experience of the self is the inner version of that experience. And sometimes the impact is so great, it shatters the ego. It can generate psychosis, this kind of experience. But when the ego is sufficiently developed, it is able to take the experience, and then it is possible to assimilate it. And see, we would say uh, the Prophet Muhammad had this experience with God, see, and the whole of Islam came from that experience. But he had an experience and got these teachings. We would say... Uh, Moses, uh, Jesus, the Buddha, you know, it, many leaders and teachers have had this inner encounter that is the theme of all our religions. Now, what often happens is that there is some religious or mythological system at the disposal of the individual. The experience will be assimilated into a particular religious formation, and it will be described as an experience of God within the precepts of that religion. But what we now have for the first time, Edinger is saying, is the opportunity to create an empirical science concerning this level of psychic reality. Always before, we had innumerable creeds of one kind or another, but we've never had the empirical science of this phenomena, and this is what Jung has made available to us. So see, we're, we're kind of moving in to look at something, something very honoring something different. Now, now let me, uh, if you're getting confused, let me give you other ways we encounter this. Let me give you some ways we encounter this and I'll come back. See, ways we encounter uh, the self. And actually, the best word for the self would be capital S. It would be sort of God within or mystery within uh, something within us that's greater than us. Like how many of y'all had a dream in the last week in the class? How many have had a dream where you woke up in the morning and went, gee, man, that was a dream. See, I had one uh, two nights ago. I wrote it down. I've been having my dreams analyzed and looked at for 20 years, 22 years, uh, because I, I had an experience where I realized, man, there's something going on. I want to learn what they're saying and what they're about, not just blow them off. But ways we encounter 
uh, the self. We encounter in uh, in fairy tales, stories. We'll talk about the mystery suddenly and without warning. It'll say, see, uh, in synchronicities. Synchronicities, you know, are those events that happen where I can't believe I was just thinking about this person. I hadn't seen them in 10 years, and I ran into them at the store the other day. Is that weird? See? Have you ever had, how many have had experiences like that, synchronicities, where weird things happen and you just go, man, well, see, Jung would say that's an encounter with the mystery, with God, with the other, with, you know. Uh, uh, we, we encounter the self in our interests. And, and interest, our interest is anything you have spontaneous energies toward. I mean, whatever turns you on, you ought to pay attention to. Because <laughs> that's probably your acorn, your true self. Whatever you're interested in. Uh, is probably the self, God within, the mystery, the potential, awakening itself. See, whatever you have spontaneous energy toward, you ought to, you ought to kind of think about that. If you want to know what you're supposed to do with your life or what do you want to, what do you want to do, follow your interests, follow your desires. Uh, and, of course, dreams and uh, outer crises. Um, you know, emotional uh, and otherwise, <laughs> uh, crises we have in life. Uh, being a, a psychologist, people come into my office, and they're usually in crises. And and my question always, and it's not doesn't come the first, but I, I start thinking. I wonder what the meaning of this is. I wonder what the inner world is trying to communicate. I wonder what loss, what new opportunity that person's having to deal with. I wonder what encounter with the self, with the mystery within this crisis is about. And then when we have aha experience, <laughs> and uh, or oh, uh, shoot, <laughs> keep our language clean in the class, <laughs> you know, or oh, shucks, <laughs> or darn, <laughs> like, you know, when you have these experiences where you just get hit in the head with a two by four metaphorically, we ought to pay attention to that. Or when you have this great aha experience, like the birth of my children. Come on in. Uh, birth of my children was a glorious aha experience. It just, it was full of, aha experiences are full of awe and wonder. You know, the rainstorm we came through today, as messy as it was, I just respect, I'm talk like a, um, uh, a, a Greek or a Roman, uh, uh, Thor, Thor was just sounding and banging in the sky. And, you know, I just was like, uh, Mother Nature was drenching us. We needed some good rain. And part of me is just connecting with all that energy. It's very powerful stuff. Well, that was a sense of awe and wonder. Of course, I didn't, when I stepped in the puddle, it became an aw oh, shoot experience. <laughs> uh, and then again, uh, we'll look some more as our projections. What we like, we're going to look at this in the next couple of classes. What we like in others and what we dislike, uh, our dislikes, really tell us about our inner world and who we really are. And then, of course, uh, our sacred stories. You know, our... our our stories from our sacred scriptures, or our text, uh, uh, the teachings. These things, you know, they, they, they touch us at a deeper level. Are you with me? You know, they, they make us think. They, they, they awaken us. It could be a story you've heard for years and years, and you hear it again, and suddenly it touches you at a deeper level. And then um, um, uh, projections, uh, it, likes is anything we admire in someone. We ought to pay attention to that. And something we're, that repulses us. We ought to pay attention to that. Because there's something beneath even the repulsion that's very positive trying to get with us. And I, I, there may be, uh, and there's probably a myriad of other things where we encounter this, this mystery. Um, 
Let, let, me, let me throw a few more in here too since I'm just kind of doing this. Uh, another one is anything that resonates. If it turns you on. Now this might sound kind of weird, but if you like to dance, the music, if it's something that's moving you, you feel the vibes inside, and it's making you feel alive, it's taking you into another place. Well, see, you ought to pay attention that that itself is an encounter with the self, with mystery. Remember, I'm not talking about doctrines and beliefs. I'm talking about an experience of something deeper than your, than your uh, uh, ego world. Uh, anything that takes you into depth, deeper into life, a death, a loss, a tragedy. Who hasn't been heartbroken over some sweetheart and it just takes your breath away and you go into a grief or a loss? Well, that's a numinous, I mean, that's a sacred experience with your deeper life. Is, is, are y'all kind of with me in here, just the concept of those unknown things we have and some of them we know? Uh, and see that the soul yearns for those kinds of experiences because that's what gives us vitality and meaning. And then uh, I'll write another word here, uh, if I can. Numinous. In you, numa. In you, numinous. And numen, in you, m i n, is actually the Greek word that means <laughs> to wink. Wink, you know, like wink your eye. A numinous experience is when you have some encounter with the sacred, with the other, with the mystery. Uh, walking out to get the paper the last morning, uh, a couple of mornings ago, as I was going back in, I have this planter box. And down toward the bottom, it's just mortar and brick in this little planter box. But there was an impatient, a white impatient flower. Apparently the seed somehow got in there. And I just got real close and looked at it. There must have been some dirt in there, and then a the seed got in there, and sure enough, that thing took root. And here at this solid brick wall is this big, white, impatient flower. And I'm, you know, we'll take a picture of it uh, this weekend. But I was just like, it took my breath away. I go, isn't that interesting? Look at that. And see, it was as if the mystery in nature is just winking at me and going, so you, you think you know everything that's going on. You know, I can grow where I want to grow. See, it was almost as if uh, the flower was... Gave me a surprise, something of beauty. Uh, another numinous experience, uh, it's, it's when we have this encounter, something that takes our breath away. We see some wonder and mystery. Uh, a couple of years ago, a friend of mine works in Herman Hospital as a psychologist, and she said, I was explaining numinous to her, and she said, oh yeah, I know about that. She said, just the other day, there was this black dog that was out in Herman Park running around, and... I stopped and looked, and there was this big black butterfly. And the dog was chasing the butterfly. And then the butterfly chased the dog. And then the dog would run away, and then the, uh, and then the dog would turn after the butterfly. And the butterfly, you'd think, would like, I'm out of here. <laughs> but the butterfly turns around and goes after the dog. And she says, I couldn't believe it. What was going on with this butterfly? I didn't know the dog could eat it. But uh, she said, so I went down the hall and I got a bunch of, I said, y'all come look at this, come look at this. And here this dog and this butterfly are gambling, as it were, playing, You're just frisky all there. And, and nature's doing this numinous winking, like, isn't life interesting? And she said, her, what was interesting is nobody else really got it. How wonderful and mysterious this was. Well, see, that would be an encounter with the self. Something that takes out of your superficiality, out of your ordinariness, where you realize there's more to life. See, uh, numinous experience. Okay. Uh, oh, by the way, the other day uh, somebody said uh, was speaking of a, uh, his brother, his two brothers, actually, uh, and he said, "Yeah, deep, deep down, they're very shallow." And I thought, what a beautiful oxymoronic statement. Deep down, they're very shallow. Well, an encounter with the self, and what I'm trying to do in this class, is deep down, we're very, very deep. But a person who's not in touch with the deeper world, deep down, they're very shallow. So I thought that was so funny. About three of you are laughing, but no, that's okay. Okay, um, so we're going to come back, and uh, we're going to have our presentations, and then I'm going to present some more stuff about the self um, in relation to ego and some good stuff to look at. You want to come and do it now? Uh, Clarence and Young. Young.
Y'all give them a hand. We have our little presentation today. We'll jump into it. about um, the Jews in America and in Israel. Um, in the 1960s, there were approximately 1.9 million Jews living in Israel, and at that same time, there were three times as much Jews living in America. <coughs> uh, since then, about 40 years later, Israel has grown to about 150% more than that population, up to 4.6 million people. Uh, million Jews, while the U.S. Um, hasn't grown hardly in the Jew population. Uh, in Israel, the Jewish, pop the Jewish population is the most demographically uh, vibrant. And in Israel, the average age, uh, well right now, the average age of Jews in Israel is 29 years old and the birth rate per mother is 2.6 and there are hardly any uh, intermarriages within the Jew population in Israel. But on the other hand, in America, uh, the average age of a Jew is 39 and the birth rate per mother is 1.6 and the intermarriage and intermarriage exceeds 52 percent. It is estimated that the uh, population in Israel by the year uh, 2010 will surpa surpass America and one generation later it is expected, expected to be 50 percent larger than that of the US. Currently there are current attempts to stop this but uh, intermarriage in the United States seems to be the main deterrent for the resurgence of Jewish America and that's about it. I have a question. Are there any uh, Jewish people in the class? See, it's happening already. <laughs> Correctly, it would be people of the Jewish religion. Of Jewish right. religion, yeah. Because Jew Judaism is a religion, it's not a race. But there's still not. Nobody here. And uh, does anybody have any solutions to the problem of Jews vanishing in America? Vanishing? Well, the title of the article is Vanishing. Right. Like more sex or something like that? Or? Yeah. That, was, that was my only solution. Your only solution, too? Yeah. <laughs> Great minds right in the same course. Okay, that's it. Thanks for your time. Okay, thank you. Good job. <laughs> Hello everyone. I'm going to do the article on At Home in America, and uh -huh. we have someone missing today who was going to do the Ivy League Gamora. They're not here, but I have read it, so I'm going to go ahead and yeah. present that okay, as well. Okay, you're right. Thanks, Clarence. At Home in America, this article seemed to shift back and forth between the idea that anti-Semitism is not really a problem to that of, well, maybe it, it could be, or it still is in America. So we're going to kind of review both ideas. The article begins by discussing how much better Jews have it now in America. Jews are more at home in America than ever before. Anti-Semitism has diminished to the point of insignificance. And that Jews have increasingly been accepted into mainstream America. Circulation of the most popular anti-Semitic weekly, The Spotlight, has decreased from 315,000 in 1981 to 112,000 in 1987, so that's a significant drop in that in that uh, publication. One of the things we have to keep in mind with this article is it's a very old article, so we don't really know what today's numbers reflect. A change in atmosphere in America after World War II, in addition to Supreme Court decisions re requiring desegregation and equal opportunity, are credited with much of the change. However, the article suggests that anti-Semitism is still alive in the hearts of many in America. There's a rather potent quote in there that I wanted to share with you. In the fall of 1992, Marge Scott, owner of the Cincinnati Reds Baseball Club, 
received negative publicity because she allegedly referred to some people of African American heritage as the N word. When interviewed by a reporter from the New York Times, she acknowledged receiving a Nazi armband with a swastika on it. And here's her quote to that reporter: "I keep it in a drawer with my Christmas with my Christmas decorations." So that Whoa. that swastika was as important to her as any Christmas decoration that she might have. That's pretty potent. That's pretty scary. Anti-Semitic stereotypes and sentiments are far more widespread than the behavior itself, according to the article. Um, however, the article again shifts gears and shares some experiences that that would suggest otherwise. Uh, behavior of uh, adolescents in college campuses, um, discrimination in the workplace. A study of 4,340 senior executives in nation's largest businesses in 1979 and 1986 compared the percentages of people of different religions in executive positions. Yes, yeah, Stacy, can you turn that on? Isn't that great? Instant service. I can just share the numbers with you. You can, you can see them. Yeah, leave them on there. Can you see them? Yeah. Scoot it up a little bit. Okay. Jews, go ahead. You're okay, looking. in 1979, as you can see by the numbers, um, Jewish Americans only accounted for 5.6 of the executive positions in America. However, by 1986, that number had increased to 7.4%. There's an interesting side note to this, though. Jews only accounted for 3% of the nation's population. They accounted for 13% of executives under the age of 40. So that, that's a significant statement in and of itself. Well, why do you think that is? I'm not really sure. Anybody have any ideas? I'm concerned that the Protestants were dropping off so much, and that's where I come out of. <laughs> <laughs> My egocentricity says. Um, prior to 1965, we'll get the slide back up? Yeah, it's up. Okay. Can you see the little monitor underneath you? Yes. Yeah. Okay. When I looked down, there was still me. Oh. Okay. Prior to 1965, um, the percentage of Jews selecting other Jews or the same faith for lifetime partners was 89%. By 1990, that had dropped to 43%. So this suggests, according to the article, that... Um, those of the Jewish faith and other faiths are becoming less concerned with uh, discrimination and uh, the issues that their children might face in school and in the workplace. Do you see that as a good thing or a bad thing? I see it as a good thing. Do you? Anti-Semitism is not one of the major concerns in the nation. There are many other issues with race, gender, and ethnicity in the United States. And the article suggests that this is both good and bad news for Jews. Good because at least they're not the current target of discrimination in a, on a large scale. But it's bad news because uh, non-Jew Americans are not paying attention to the prejudice that has existed for over 2,000 years. And so they're probably not right. doing anything actively to address those issues. And it might come up again. I have a couple of questions for you. Do you believe that Jews are still the target of prejudice in America? Does anyone still believe that they are? Uh, I don't think so. Um, I have several Jew friends, or Jewish friends, <laughs> and uh, they, like, I was reading the article and writing my summary on it, and I kept, like, asking them, like, have you ever heard about this, or have you ever experienced that? And, like, they had never heard about any of that. So, uh, wow. I don't think... Jews are still persecuted. Okay. Very good. Can you think wait, of any wait, other... Wait, wait, wait. A couple more quick comments. I'm sorry. I missed one. Yeah. I apologize. Shemera. Oh, that's okay. Um, um, I just wanted to say, like, the article made a good point by saying that there's still, like, um, anti-Semitic sentiments that exist, mean, especially mm -hmm. when we, um, they mentioned the African-American community, especially mm -hmm. in New York City. Yes. But the, the amount of anti-Semitic behavior has decreased significantly right. and so that differentiation it when it made it more clear when they said that so yes absolutely back to your question about this do you think it's a generational 
thing? Do you think your friends potentially don't experience of this just because there have been several generations? Probably. I don't. I mean, I couldn't speak for them. Okay. Or I, I, I don't know, think maybe they shared anything with you. Or they didn't like share me with their father's experience with. Yes, yeah, so far as a question. I don't think they're like. The, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think they're the main targets, but um, they they still are, and unfortunately, you know, there are anti-Semitic things. And like when um, the uh, the Passion movie came out, yes, there was this right. whole craze of anti-Semitism, mm -hmm. and they were then they were blaming Jews for this high death and everything. And, even in the Denver newspaper, the headline said, the Jews killed Christ. Right. So there were, and sports like that, I guess, did bring in anti-Semitism to like real high, but mm -hmm. I don't think it's the main source of discrimination. Okay. Yeah, and since 9-11, who else is being discriminated? That was my next question. Can you think uh, of any other yeah, isn't that Americans right? we're so discriminated against together in the same this. way? Or at the same level? Any other culture, any other group that Americans target, <laughs> either consciously or otherwise? Is yes. Sir. Well, for right now, Arabs, that's the main um, target, especially, I mean, it's very clear at the airports, um, especially me, I travel a lot, and so I see it a lot when I go um, to the airport. Um, random checking is not so random anymore, and um, <laughs> that kind of stuff, so. Okay. How, do you, how do you deal with it, Samara? Do you just... I mean, do you just go with um, it, or do you? It's really interesting because um, the, it's even like it's even a, dis, a differentiation between um, females and males, and so I'll get I'll I won't get as much of a eyebrow lift as maybe my dad would or something like uh -huh. that, and um, I just think they probably think that um, we're not as I mean we're just not as much of a threat than than males right. are. And um, we just kind of deal with it. I mean, we can't really do much about it. We just kind of go with the flow and do what we have to do to get to wherever we want to go. <laughs> right, right. Wow. Yes. I just have a comment about random checking. Like, I was flying, uh, like, a couple weeks after 9-11, and uh, they were doing the random checks, and my name and my sister's name came up, and we were standing at the end of the line. So they just came and like looked at us and said, oh, all right, you guys have to, I'm fine, just go on in. Even though our name came up on the, on the whatever randomness list. How'd you feel about that? Um, I was kind of disappointed in them, but happy that I got on the plane. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Any other questions about that particular article? OK. The other one's very short. It's only a one-page article. It's got some potent ideas in it, and it's called Ivy League Gamora. It's a question. Five students say that Yale dorms are too risque for them. Does that trample their religious freedom? And it talks about a tour of the dorms by a freshman. And he was rather surprised at the close proximity of males and females within the dorm. Uh, while they're not on the same floor, it's just it was just one little staircase away. Uh, another thing that was offensive to him was uh, a container of condoms that was readily available for anyone, I guess, who wanted them, and it had some kind of signage on it that said the good stuff. <laughs> campus policy uh, refuses at Yale refuses to allow freshmen to live off campus. Um, their philosophy is that students need to learn to live and let live. Um, However, they, they tend to kind of wink at it. If the student will go ahead and pay their dorm fees of $6,850, they don't really care where you live. You have an on-campus address, and they don't really care. Uh, so that was offensive as well. While Yale may be the battle round, this is likely not a uniquely Jewish issue. The article is suggesting that they weren't just targeting Jews. It, it was just any culture that happened to have uh, religious issues, they, they weren't willing to face these. A uh, couple questions about that article. Do you agree with the idea of co-ed housing? Do you think that campuses should uh, respect religious ideas and let fresh, freshmen live off campus? Yes, sir. I don't think it's an issue about letting freshmen live on campus. I think you should be able to live in terms of off campus. You should 
off campus, I mean, you should be able to live off campus. There shouldn't be a rule saying you have to be on campus. Mm -hmm. In terms of like the co ed thing, restricted just because if it is co ed, you know, so many things are going to happen, you know, and especially at like um, the way they do it at like. Um, like a religious school, like St. Joseph's or something, where it mm -hmm. is co-ed, because it's a religious school. Yes. I think, I think that's good. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. Um, I think like uh, as far as the co-ed housing goes and as far as the, having the freshmen being forced to live on campus, um, I think the greater issue is that you don't have a choice. I mean, I know you're saying that they kind of wink at it, but even, I mean, I think everybody should have the choice to live as they wish. I mean, if they, won't, they should have an option, I guess I'm saying, as far as if they want to live on campus or not or if they want to live in a co-ed housing or not. But uh, I think Yale's point is a valid one that they're they're kind of like people would choose, kind of choose to live in their own shells sometimes and refuse to deal with the greater culture that I think there has to be some degree of acculturation that you have to you have to learn to live within other people's society and you have to learn to deal with them not hide from it you just addressed my second question thank you anyone else have any thoughts on that Yes, that's it. Way to go, Clarence. Big hand for Clarence. Thank you. Yeah, some of these articles probably need a little working on, don't they? But that's interesting. Yeah, one of the things we'll, uh, we'll look at when we go to the Holocaust uh, Museum, and uh, th those of you, uh, you get two extra credit points if you go to the Holocaust Museum and then write it up. Um, about a page, page and a half of your experiences there. But one of the things we'll discover, in fact, I guess I didn't need to rip it, but I did. Oh, this is yours. Yeah. Thank you. Um, is that uh, down here in the unconscious, too, are our, our wounds, and uh, as well as our, uh, our gifts. <laughs> Remember, we talked to the center of this uh, the, called the, the, uh, the soul or the self. Uh, but our wounds are down here too, and also our limitations. Um, and if your ego is not, your ego is not yet aware of life's, your own wounds and sufferings you've been through, they've been repressed. What we do is we're likely to project that stuff out on somebody else. If I can't accept the part of me that's a loser, that I lose in life, but that doesn't have to, that's just part of life. It doesn't have to defame my character. If I can't accept it, then I'm going to attack other people. Uh, if I can't accept, accept my gifts, um, my uh, opportunities, um, if I can't accept I have those, then I might project those out on somebody else. And, and oh yeah, thank you. Thank you for telling me too. Uh, just the, the the whole world underneath the water, the unconscious, is full of our inner world issues. And what we'll look at, um, and I may talk about this the week right before we go to the uh, Holocaust thing, but uh, if you can learn to deal with the the wounded, neglected part of your own psyche, and if we could use that metaphorically to say that the wounded Jew within, it could be the wounded Native American, the wounded. Uh, a physically disabled person. It could be the wounded. Anything that's anything that's displaced. So if you'll let me finish, uh, I'll do the metaphor. If if you'll learn to deal with a wounded Jew within, there's less likely your inner Nazi will attack other people or yourself. And a person who's attacking others and killing and destroying others, usually there's something inside they haven't come to terms with. And so we project it out on somebody else. We've seen that in racism. The whole class has been about that is that uh, we have to attack those other people and things that remind us of our own limitations in life or our jealousies or things like that. And um, that's a powerful um, metaphor of uh, sort of looking at who we are and what we're about. Um, a couple of things uh, I want to do here to finish talking about the self. And I know we're just doing it here in one class. Um, and this is good for your... Uh, for a test question. Um, the self is the um, 
it's the uh, great uh, promoter uh, of wholeness. This is a this is the self would is another word for self is interesting would be nature's intent. <laughs> Nature's intent. I mean, who you really are, who God made you to be, <laughs> what the what was in the acorn all along. It's the great promoter of wholeness. Uh, it's also the uh, the uh, it's the unifier of the uh, collective unconscious. I'll explain what that means. It sort of unifies, uh, 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 unifier, uh, it's the unifier of opposites. I love myself, I hate myself. <laughs> I, uh, I, I'm glad, I, I, you know, all the yin and yang in life, sadness, happiness, love, hate, all these opposites that are part of the human experience, the self within, somehow we're able to live with that and, uh, and find something meaningful about that. It's uh, another word, it's the central guiding force. Uh, of life. The central guiding force um, in realizing one's potential. It's in other words for in other words for God within for uh, this this self. The self is within us. See let, let me just do it around the room here. This might be fun to do and and uh, you know what what kind of things uh, um, what kind of things like turn you on? And everybody's going to go, sex. Well, that's fine. Sex in its essence is really a spiritual experience uh, because sex with love and commitment and relatedness is the greatest thing humans can have relative to an encounter with the divine. I mean, all the sacred stories talk about that. It's a very mystical thing. It's when we cheapen it to like a bunch of dogs that we get in trouble because you, you can't have sex without soul being involved. Uh, you can't have sex without one's self-worth and value. Do you love me? Do you care for me? Will you love me in the morning kind of stuff? All that saying, there's more to this than just an act and, and uh, uh, aesthetic feelings. There's something greater than that. But what are some things in here that, that really awaken you? And I've already mentioned nature for me. But just kind of go around the room. Uh, just kind of, what, what are the things that, that give you a sense of wonder and awe and uh, an enlarged personality? Uh, I know Samara would be your faith does, doesn't it? Your Islam faith? Yeah, it does, because she's the one invited me to go to uh, um, a workshop on Muhammad, which is wonderful. Uh, how about you? Anything? I mean, it could be anything. Sunsets? Um, the beach? And what are some things that really make you feel alive? Push the button there and just say... I guess just random little things in life, just like yeah. in nature. I mean, okay. I may be walking, I may see like leaves falling off trees and just wonder, yeah, okay. you know. And that, that's an encounter with the self, with the mystery, with the creator. How about you? What? Or like certain kinds of music? Okay, how about you? Anything? What? Nature, okay. Back on the back row. Um, I would say my family, spending time with your family, the love, the closeness, the connectedness. See, those are mystical experiences. Yeah, well, how about you? Uh, my faith. Your faith? Yeah. yeah the, to connect with something greater than the ego. See, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about this as more to life than my little superficial ego. There's so much more. Yeah, uh, how about you? Um, nature. Nature does. And back here on the back row. On what? The unknown. the unknown. Yeah, mystery. Uh, see, dance is something for me. I started dancing about 15 years ago, uh, or 10 years ago after my divorce. Country and Western dancing, and I just there's something about dancing that just makes me feel so alive and stuff. Yes. Um, I don't know. Sometimes when I go out of the country, uh, go to the folks 
Because they're kind of poor. Yeah. I see they can live and be happy. Yeah. He isn't that interesting. See, so the encounter with the self is not always... Uh, sometimes it's... Uh, Where's all my list? Oh, it's over here. Sometimes uh, another encounter, I, I forgot, things that, uh, are we on here? Things that humble us. Things that give uh, humiliate us. Or things, uh, we, we see the mystery in, in the simplicity of life. Now, it's not always ecstasy. Sometimes, let me say this, sometimes it's in the agonies of life. As well as the ecstasies. See, both of them are these powerful encounters that we have all the time. Yes, uh, next. What was you, what's something with you that just sort of awakens you or gives you a sense of... Um, for me, it's like, it's half religion and it's half, like, I want to say physics or astronomy because, like, it's how religion and religion kind of implies the physics right. of everything, of, like, the entire world, of the yeah. entire world. So, how, like, in the Bible, um, in the Bible or in the Quran that it states, like, different facts that are yeah. relevant to this world and to religious and secular and all that stuff. Absolutely. I love that. Uh, uh, my daughter's an astronomer, and she just teaches me so much about out there, and it creates a sense of wonder. In fact, she told me one time, uh, say, she said, Dad, you know why I like to teach astronomy? And she said, because it awakens wonder. And she said, wonder is an antidote for narcissism. She said, we have a culture where nobody has any wonder anymore. Everybody's just superficially going through the little deal. But, she, but I love that concept of wonder is an antidote for self-centeredness and stuff. Yes, a couple, you got anything up here? Um, Kalea, how about you, Sam? Your faith does? Okay, awakens you. How about you? Food. Food. Yeah. Yeah. Food. Yeah. Just eating for or like different tastes and smells. And yeah, I love all kinds of food. But uh, yeah. also I like it when I see like um, elderly people when they're healthy. I like yeah. health. Yeah. Just being healthy. Yeah. And see, all these are these numinous encounters. How about you? Anything? Music. Music. Yeah, that is so, so rich. And see, music is something we all do in every tribe and culture. Yes, Andy? Waves. Waves. Are you a beach person? Yeah. Yeah, me too. I love the waves. Are you surf? Yeah. So, yeah, waves have, have a mystical something that connects us. Is that on the back row? Nature. What? Nature. Nature, yeah, yeah. Back here on the far back, I'm behind you. I have no idea. I love the answer. Go ahead. Do you have anything? Shopping. Shopping? Yeah. yeah. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. All the things and beauties. And, you know, shopping is just a walk in art because you see so many <laughs> ways people artistically put things together. A couple more things. What about you? I guess more physical challenges. Yeah. Yeah. Like now I play table tennis. Yeah, good. And it, it gives you a sense of get coming, finding a bigger part of yourself or getting outside yourself, a challenge or something. I think that's what sports do for it. Sports and relaxing. How about you? Anything? Sports and music. How music, like you can just tell your story through through songs and through, yeah. yeah, yeah, like your life story just through a song. Okay, good. Clarence, anything? Not really? Nothing. Music. Music does. Yeah. <laughs> See, it kind of takes us out of our world into this other world. And this is what religion is all about, and it may not be formal for all of us, but we're all connecting. Okay. You have anything? Uh, I have. Mathematics? That is so good. It's the only thing I made A's in in college was math, and I'm in psychology now. But that math is... How about you? Push the little button there. Uh, I say, uh, dancing. Wow, that's good. You got tickets to the game? Players. Baseball players? <laughs> <laughs> Do you date a baseball player? Yes, and over there. Y'all have anything? <laughs> like yeah. Getting away from everything, like going out of town <laughs> and stuff, like going... Like traveling? Yeah, traveling and seeing and responding. We, we carry within the wonders we see that. I think another one for me has become solitude. That ability to be alone. Anybody like being alone? I mean, in, the, in your own inner world? Now, it's something I couldn't do for 50 years, but through a lot of suffering and stuff for the last few years, I've learned not to just be by myself, but to be with myself in that inner world with my thoughts and weird ideas and strange things. Um, okay, so we've looked at the self. And uh, we've defined ways we encounter it. And right here, because we're going to show you a 
Oh, we have more time than I thought. Uh, it's the great promoter of wholeness. That's a good test question. It's the unifier of the collective unconscious. Uh, that actually the union of opposites is what the mystery does. <laughs> How can we all get along, you know, when we're so different? And it's the center guiding force in realizing one's potential. And see, to the degree your religious faith inculcates and, and awakens all of this, then it's really useful for becoming uh, your, your authentic self. Um, okay, we're going to look some more at this at the next class, but don't get up because i got a film for you that I want to uh, look at. Uh, and... Uh, this uh, little piece that we're gonna, I'm going to show you, I actually saw it about two years ago when I was homesick with the flu. And uh, uh, Stacy, come back over here. Thing. This is what happens when you mix uh, numinous religious encounters from different cultures. And you'll see uh, why I'm a psychologist and not an artist. Uh, if this is the U.S., kind of, Gulf of Mexico and Spain, I mean, uh, what, England and Spain. And Africa, kind of. You kind of get it? Sort of? Kind of? Okay, well, this is a song. Uh, what I'm going to show you, this was actually done at a conference at Carnegie Hall. This is a, a Christian religious group uh, singing, and so don't be offended by it, but just watch it. But what happens is this song, uh, the, the tune of the song comes out of an African uh, uh, chant. A religious chant, but the words come out of a guy, a uh, uh, a, 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 a British, uh, a Christian, a slave owner, a, a, a slave ship captain, <laughs> and he heard this African chant, and so what he does, oops, African chant from Africa. So here's here's this, the tune comes from one culture, the word comes from another culture, and. It's, uh, it's put together in a song, which is kind of beautiful how you'll see uh, when uh, 2 plus 2 equals 5, when something wonderful is created. And you all probably know this song, but I like it because it has a lot of passion, and I thought it would be fun to show at the end of class today. So let's uh, run this film. And this guy can sing. I met this guy about uh, three weeks ago. He was in town, and I went out of my way to go meet him. Uh, Stacy, you want to run that? And wonderful guy, and he's involved in helping kids and Prisoners, children. Well, you can't sing like that just coming from the ego, right? <laughs> you got to sing at a deeper place. That's the connection with God, the mystery, the self within. I thought it was a great example. Great. I'll see you all next class. Uh, stay dry. It's probably already passed.